Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lawrence Livermore National Lab's Virtual Science on Saturday series. I'm Dr. Joanna Albala, the manager of the Science Education Program at the laboratory, and this is the fourth and final lecture in this year's Science on Saturday series, Energy and the Environment. Once again, we're excited to share the many ways in which the lab is doing cutting edge research in many different areas relevant to our planet. Now, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping instructions. Depending on your device, if you go to the top right hand corner on the top of the slides, you'll see a little screen icon. And if you click on the side by side view, this will maximize the slides and the speaker view to the right of the slides. You've entered the event muted with your cameras off and you'll not be able to cross chat. However, if you have questions, you may enter them in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. You may also look like you're the only one here, but there are over 150 on our call today. I also wanna acknowledge that we will be recording the presentation so no outside recording or screenshots are permitted. Finally, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank you for taking the poll. And I see that many of you are joining us from Livermore and also from right outside our Livermore area. So now let's welcome our presenters today. Mark Zelenka received a BS in meteorology from Penn State University and a PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Washington. He is currently a climate scientist in the atmosphere, earth and energy division at Lawrence Livermore Lab. He is joined by Aaron Donahue, who received a BA in mathematics from Sonoma State University, an MS in applied mathematics from San Diego State University, and a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Notre Dame. He is also a climate scientist in the atmospheric and earth energy division at the lab. They're joined by Gemma Anderson, who received a master's in physics from Lancaster University, a Master of Advanced Study in Mathematics from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in Theoretical Early Universe Cosmology from the University of Sussex. She's a research scientist and deputy group leader for the Energy Group in the Atmosphere, Earth, and Energy Division. They are joined by Stan Hitomi, who received a BS in Biology from UC Berkeley and a Master's in Athletic Administration from St. Mary's College. He retired in 2020 after 31 years as a teacher, principal, and district administrator in the San Ramon Valley Unified School District, and is currently a faculty scholar in the science education program at LLNL. And now, without further ado, let's get started. So I'm going to go first, and um, what I'd like to do um, right off the bat is um, try to convince you that Earth's climate is currently undergoing rapid changes that are unprecedented in Earth's history. So the first indicator of this that's very clear is the fact that global surface temperature is rising over time. So what you're seeing here is a plot of globally averaged surface temperature from 1880 until the present. Uh, this is in degrees Celsius, so you have to multiply it by about two to get to Fahrenheit. Um, but as you see earlier in the record in the late 1800s and early 1900s, a uh, lot of blue colors and low temperatures followed by later in the century up to the present, uh, red colors and higher temperatures. So you can see a very clear trend uh, over the entire globe of warmer temperatures. And so since about 1950, we've seen about two degrees Fahrenheit of global warming. So this is just in about the span of a human lifetime. There's already been about two degrees Fahrenheit of globally averaged warming. This is what the map of trends in warming over the last 30 years looks like. You can see that over most of the planet, uh, it's red indicating that the planet is warming, but of course that's not happening evenly everywhere. There's certain areas where there's a little bit less warming like around uh, Antarctica, as well as certain areas of the ocean, uh, but over the continents in particular and at the high northern latitudes in the Arctic, um, we're seeing very dramatic increases in temperature through time. One of the implications of a warming planet is that global sea level rises. And that's because of two things. One is that uh, a warmer body of water expands upward, so it gets higher, uh, but also because of the melting of ice and that water flowing into the ocean. So what you're seeing here is again from 1880 until the present, the change in globally averaged sea level uh, relative to 1993 to 2008. And so it's a very clear upward trend. And in fact, the trend is 
um, not perfectly straight. It's actually kind of increasing over time. So it's a bit of an acceleration uh, recently in the rise of sea level. And so this is in millimeters. So if you want to convert that to something we're more used to, this is about a foot of sea level rise uh, since about 1880 over time. But as I said, it's kind of accelerating a bit in recent years. The big reason for the increase in sea level, as I mentioned, is the loss of ice. So as the planet warms, ice melts, uh, and that water has to flow somewhere. It flows into the ocean. So if you look at our two big ice sheets, one in Antarctica and one in Greenland, you can see that just over the last 20 years, they've lost uh, massive amounts of ice, and that ice has melted into water, which has flown into the ocean. Um, so what you're seeing here is the uh, quantity of ice on Antarctica and Greenland in gigatons of mass. And a gigaton is a billion with a B tons. Um, so this is, uh, for example, in Greenland, we've seen 5,000 billion tons of ice has melted um, just in the last 20 years. Um, so this is very, very dramatic changes that are occurring uh, essentially right before our eyes. Now, it may be hard to wrap your head around what a gigaton or 5,000 gigatons of ice is. Um, so conveniently, NASA has this uh, graphic that you can see what that means. So that's actually enough water to form a sheet uh, 26 feet high, so about the height of a two-story building that covers the entire state of Texas. So that's what Greenland has put into the ocean just over the last 20 years or so. And we have um, a slightly smaller amount of that also coming from Antarctica over that same period of time. So this is a fairly huge amount of um, water that's flowing into the oceans and causing sea level rise. Of course, Antarctica and Greenland are not the only places that have ice on the planet. We also have mountain glaciers, um, many of which flow into the ocean. And um, as they melt, they dump that water into the ocean. So here's one example of a glacier from 1917 and the same exact glacier um, more recently in 2005. And so if you just flip back and forth between these, the mountain stays in the same spot, but you can see that the ice has largely gone away or receded very dramatically up into the mountains. So all that water goes somewhere, it goes into the ocean and causes sea level rise. So very dramatic changes over the, over, of Earth's, over the course of Earth's history. There's also ice floating in the ocean. So this is Arctic sea ice, um, and that has been undergoing very dramatic declines as well, uh, both in its extent, which is essentially the area coverage of the Arctic that has ice on it, as well as the volume, which also accounts for the thickness of that ice. So just over the last 40 years or so, we've seen very dramatic decreases in the coverage and the volume of Arctic sea ice. Um, so just over the course of, again, uh, a 40 year period, the Arctic has undergone really dramatic changes. Um, and it's a very different world than it was when, say, I was a kid. This is a similar uh, image, but now showing the map of the sea ice thickness during the winter in the Arctic. Um, and so what you see at the beginning of the record right here around 1979, as it goes, there you go. Um, the Arctic is very, um, it has a large coverage of ice, very thick ice over much of the Arctic Ocean. And as you get to the end of the record here, you can see that it's confined mainly just to the high, uh, the region just uh, adjacent to um, Canada and Greenland, uh, with much of the Arctic actually having very little ice at all. And that which is there is actually quite thin. So you've seen a dramatic thinning and receding of the area that has uh, a lot of ice cover. So the Arctic is a very different place than it was uh, 40 or even 30 years ago. So I hope that I've convinced you that there are very dramatic changes going on right now uh, in the climate system. Um, but what is the cause of these rapid and unprecedented changes in the climate system? And the answer is um, greenhouse gases. Um, it's very clear that what's causing this is not the sun or changes in ocean cycles or any other sort of process that we have accounted for, but it's greenhouse gases. And these are small uh, molecules in the atmosphere. Most of the atmosphere is not made up of greenhouse gases. These are um, a very small part of the atmosphere, uh, but they're very powerful in the sense that they absorb uh, radiation and, and heat the earth. So these are some examples of the primary greenhouse gases, water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide. And all of these, except for water vapor, are emitted by human activities and have shown a very large increase in recent times, as I'll show in a second. 
So how does that work? The greenhouse effect works like this. Sunlight reaches the Earth. That's what causes a, the basic heating of the planet. Um, and the planet emits heat to space. Um, but these gases that are in the atmosphere absorb that heat and radiate that back towards the surface of the planet. So the greenhouse gases are essentially trapping heat in the atmosphere and preventing it from escaping to space. Um, and so as you add more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, um, it's essentially like putting another layer of a blanket on um, through time. And so that prevents heat from escaping, space, escaping the Earth to space and causes the planet to warm. And so that's basically what we've been doing um, over the last, say, 150 years. So let's take a look at what carbon dioxide, this very potent greenhouse gas, has done over the past 800,000 years. We can measure carbon dioxide concentrations by looking at ice cores, where we drill a giant core into the Antarctic ice sheet and look at what was contained in the air bubbles in that ice sheet. And that allows us to go back through time. Um, and we can, in fact, go back uh, 800,000 years and see what the carbon dioxide concentrations were. What you see is that carbon dioxide has wiggled around between about 180 parts per million, which is uh, 180 molecules per, mo per million molecules of air, uh, between that and about 300. Um, and it's done this for the last 800,000 years or so. And when CO2 is high, it's a relatively warm climate. And when CO2 is low, that's uh, what we call ice ages. And those have occurred roughly every 100,000 years for the last 800,000 years. The most recent ice age when CO2 was low was about 20,000 years ago. So that's what's indicated there. So what have we done just in the, just in the past 150 years is um, cause CO2 to, to go way outside of this range of natural variability. And the reason that this has happened is because humans have industrialized. We have um, taken carbon dioxide out of the ground and put it in the atmosphere, essentially, by burning coal and oil and natural gas. Um, and so you're seeing that coming out of the smokestacks. This is what powers most of our energy um, over time, has been burning coal and oil and natural gas. And we've also deforested uh, large portions of the planet. So for example, right now, a lot of the Amazon rainforest is being deforested, and that puts a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So the combination of um, burning coal, oil, and natural gas for our energy and deforesting the planet has caused this really rapid spike, which is essentially in the blink of an eye in geological time um, to very high levels currently um, that are um, quite unprecedented, at least in the most recent geologic past. So I now like to convince you that um, just very briefly, that climate change is mostly bad for us. And I'll give you just one close to home example. So the fact that the planet is warming by, say, two degrees Fahrenheit over the last 50 years, that may not seem like a very dramatic thing, but um, the very local impacts can be very real and very devastating. So let me just give you one close to home example. And this is showing you the top 20 California wildfires. And uh, the way this is plotted is by the millions of acres that are burned. And each color refers to a different time period. So the gray would be the most of the 1900s. Blue is just 2000 to 2009. Orange is 2010 to 2019. And the red colors are just the last two years. And so again, these are the top 20 most devastating largest wildfires. So what you can see is that 18 of the top 20 largest wildfires have occurred just since 2000. And nine of these, so almost half of the biggest wildfires have occurred just in the last two years. And so this is exactly what you expect to occur in a climate that's getting drier and hotter, which is what we're experiencing in California. Now, this is not entirely caused by climate change. Of course, there's forest management issues. Um, we have an aging infrastructure of power lines that are going through the forest. Um, but the fact that the planet is getting drier and hotter in California um, is definitely contributing to this and the trends are not pointing in the right direction for this becoming a, a issue that'll be easy to solve um, without essentially reversing um, these trends in climate change. Let's move now to looking at what our potential futures are. So here I'll just show you again what this um, time series of global average temperature is that we saw earlier. Uh, now I'm showing in addition the degrees Fahrenheit on the right, so that makes it a little bit easier to put into the terms that we're used to. So again, this is the warming that we've experienced thus far in the climate. Let's just expand these axes out. So now I'm expanding it out to 2100 so we can look into the future. 
and I'm widening the vertical axis because there's going to be uh, projections into the future which uh, are showing warming. Um, so what I'll show next are plausible future climates that are simulated by climate models. And you'll hear a lot more from Aaron um, next about what climate models are, but just know for now that um, we can simulate the Earth's climate on a computer, on a supercomputer, um, and we can run a variety of different scenarios. So we're, we can model how the Earth will respond if we increase greenhouse gases or decrease greenhouse gases or um, you know, any plausible scenario that we can imagine. And so let's take a look at what some climate models project for the future, depending on our different emissions scenarios. This would be a plausible future if we continue to emit a lot of fossil fuels. So if we really commit ourselves to burning a lot of coal and oil and natural gas, and we resist um, putting in renewable energy, and we continue to deforest large portions of the planet, like the tropical rainforest, and we don't reforest, um, this would be a plausible future that we could experience um, with a close to 10 degrees of warming uh, by 2100. Now, here's an alternative, which is if you, if the client, if the uh, humans decide to switch to a much more green economy with renewable energy from wind and solar, if we reforest areas that have been deforested, um, we could avert much of that warming and actually have a much more muted response of, say, maybe only three to four degrees warming by 2100. And of course, there's all kinds of scenarios in between. What if we do a little bit of both? We continue to emit greenhouse gases, but we have a bit of more of a mix of renewables in there as well. We could probably hit some target in between. So what this highlights um, is, our, is one of our main uncertainties in going forward, is what are humans going to do? Which emissions path will we choose? Are we going to emit a lot of greenhouse gases, or are we going to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions? So this is uncertainty number one, humans. But even if we know uh, a given future emissions pathway, there's still uncertainty in the climate response. And that's what a lot of climate scientists like myself uh, work on, is trying to narrow down um, this uncertainty in the climate response. So let's just take this middle trajectory as an example. The amount of warming that we expect if we emit greenhouse gases at this level is sensitive um, to how um, sensitive the climate is to greenhouse gases. So if Earth is particularly sensitive to greenhouse gases, we'd expect more warming, so something like this. But what if Earth is less sensitive to greenhouse gases? Then it might warm less. Um, so there's a whole range of possibilities here um, that we still do not know as a, as a scientific community, but that we're trying to pin down better. And so that's one of the main areas of research that we do here at, Nat at Lawrence Livermore, is trying to pin down this uncertainty number two, which is how sensitive is the climate. So just to review, we have two uncertainties. One is humans. What path will we choose going forward, emitting a lot of greenhouse gases or transitioning rapidly to a renewable energy type of economy? And the other uncertainty is for a given pathway, how sensitive is the climate? Now, just briefly, what is driving this uncertainty in how sensitive the climate is? Oh, before I get to that, let me just say, let me just put this into context. So. 10 degrees of warming may not seem like much, um, but it turns out that the last ice age 20,000 years ago was about 11 degrees uh, Fahrenheit colder than today. So this was a time when we had ice sheets that were two miles thick over much of the Northern Hemisphere instead of just being located over Greenland. Uh, we had woolly mammoths roaming around the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so this was a very different world. Um, and so, and this is in the ballpark of what we're talking about if we were to continue to emit at a very high rate into the future. Or even if we uh, emit at a slightly less rate, we're still getting about halfway to this level of, you know, 11 degrees of warming, which is a very different planet. So these are, these are pretty dramatic changes that we're talking about. These are not small numbers. Many of the countries around the world have agreed to try to limit uh, warming to something like two degrees Celsius, which is a little bit under four degrees Fahrenheit, or even if we can to try to get to one and a half degrees of warming Celsius. Um, because basically every degree that we warm is considered more and more dangerous. And it's been largely agreed upon that two degrees warming is um, going to be very difficult to deal with as humans. Um, and that we should try our best to uh, avoid hitting those targets. So there's something known as the Paris Agreement, which is something that's an inter international agreement that 
different countries around the world have agreed to try to limit emissions so that we can try to avoid passing two degrees Celsius, which is about four degrees Fahrenheit of global warming. So again, these are the types of numbers that we're dealing with going forward into the future. Now, just to summarize, what does our future hold? What we know for sure is that more warming is in store, um, just based on um, the fact that we have not yet begun to really strongly cut emissions and that our emissions are, of greenhouse gases are continuing to rise. So it's without a question that more warming is in store. And we know for sure that more warming is mostly bad for us. Um, there's very few exceptions. Like if you wanna grow crops in um, Northern Canada or Siberia, or you want to kayak to the North Pole or something, maybe you consider climate change good for you, but by and large, um, climate change is very bad for us and including here in California where we have to deal with wildfires. The things that we don't know is exactly how much warming is in our future. And the reasons why are two things. One is we don't know what humans are going to do in the future, how much we're going to emit, and we don't know how sensitive Earth's climate is to CO2 exactly. So regarding this last point, I'll just conclude with this last bit on why we don't know how sensitive the Earth, the climate is to greenhouse gases. It turns out that the answer has to do with clouds. So as the planet warms, clouds can increase in coverage or decrease in coverage. And you can see just from comparing a cloud-free Earth with a cloudy Earth, that a cloudy Earth is much brighter than a cloud-free Earth. So this Earth reflects a lot of sunlight away, just like sunscreen. Um, but if clouds were to go away, um, you'd have much less sunscreen. And so you'd be absorbing a lot more um, sunlight which can cause further heating of the planet. So as we go forward in time, are clouds going to decrease with warming, um, causing an amplification of that warming, or will they actually increase with warming, which could cause kind of a dampening uh, and a less sensitive climate? This is one of the challenges that we're trying to face in the climate community. And one of the things that we're doing is to improve our climate models that we can better simulate uh, clouds. And you'll hear more about strategies to do that in Aaron's talk, which is coming up. Um, but before we get to that, we have a demonstration um, from Stanley um, showing how you can actually generate clouds yourself at home. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stanley next. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. And as Mark just uh, was telling us, uh, clouds play a really important role in the Earth's climate. And what I'm gonna do this morning is uh, Give you a little demonstration of how you can make a, a cloud in a bottle so that's a perfect segue mark thank you so much so as most of you know clouds form naturally in the air uh, water vapor which is an invisible gas uh, condenses and forms tiny droplets on particles uh, like dust that's floating in the air we call those condensation nuclei and when enough of these droplets form uh, they come together and form a visible cloud uh, so what we're going to do this morning is show how we can create that type of a cloud. And before we start, I'm going to say that anytime you're doing a, an experiment or a demonstration, you should be taking safety precautions. So I have my safety glasses on, I have my gloves, and I have a lab coat on the, the required PPE. Uh, to do this experiment, you'll also need a two liter bottle. You'll need some rubbing alcohol they can purchase at the pharmacy isopropyl alcohol and you're also going to need some kind of a pump, like a bicycle pump of some type and probably most importantly at the end of the pump you're going to need to have a connector in this case we're using a rubber stopper you could also use a cork and you're going to need to make sure that there is a hole uh, dug through that stopper so that the air can transfer from the pump to the bottle Okay, so those are the basic materials that you'll need. And to start this demonstration, I'm just going to take the two liter bottle and I'm going to go ahead and pour just a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, really just, just enough to cover the bottom. Just a little bit. Okay. Then I'm going to take my bottle and Make sure that the alcohol is spreading all around on the inside of the bottle. Do that by rotating and making sure that the liquid is coating the inside of the bottle. 
Then I'm going to go ahead and take my stopper and make sure that it's firmly placed in. And, and because we're going to generate a lot of pressure in this experiment, uh, you should always make certain that it is not pointing towards any person or anything that could be damaged or hurt. All right. So now that that's firmly in place, I'm going to go ahead and give my pump right here two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And when it gets hard to push that pump, you know you're right there. And carefully, because once again, this is really under high pressure, you're going to go ahead and make sure you're holding on to it and pointing it away from anybody, and then you pull it away. See the cloud in that bottle. Okay. So hopefully you can see all that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on inside that bottle. So what happened here is as we pumped uh, from the pump, we were forcing air molecules into this bottle which was increasing the pressure and increasing the heat and causing the alcohol and any uh, water that was in here to evaporate. Uh, and then when we removed the stopper, we then released the pressure. There was cooling within the bottle and getting condensation and allowing the cloud to form, okay? Uh, as I said earlier, in the real world, uh, out in the atmosphere, uh, you, it wouldn't be alcohol. It would just be water, all right? We're using alcohol here because alcohol has a lower boiling point, 82 degrees Celsius versus the 100, uh, made it easier and produced a much more dramatic effect. You could just do the same with just water uh, in the bottle, uh, but you'd have to introduce small particles to allow for the, uh, the condensation like, like smoke but something that you can enjoy in the classroom and at home. And I hope you enjoyed that demonstration and uh, we'll turn it over now to Aaron. Thank you so much. Wonderful uh, experiment, which is actually a great segue into talking about computational modeling. Um, there's sort of like two ways to do science and one way would be in the laboratory like making your own cloud. And another way would be to use the supercomputers that we have access in universities and here at the lab. So I'm gonna talk about global climate modeling. And so um, at the end of Mark's talk, he was talking about all these future trajectories that we uh, have for, you know, what can we expect in the future climate uh, regime and how we got there uh, was using these global climate models of which, which are produced all over the world. Many, um, many academic institutions, many countries, have their own global climate models and they contribute to the, the, the global body of knowledge on what to expect in the future. So first I'm gonna start by saying like, what exactly is a global climate model? Well, in the simplest terms, a global climate model is we take earth and we break it down into computational code, which allows us to then simulate earth on supercomputers. So the next question is, why would we need global climate models instead of just trying to come up with physical intu intuition? Well, Mark was uh, very good at explaining that we are entering into unexpected, unprecedented times uh, where it's hard to tell what we can expect the future to hold. We do understand the physics of the world, like how do clouds form, what happens when things get warmer or colder, but it's we don't have a record of which we can rely on to say, well, if it's warm like this now, in 100 years, we expect something else to happen. We have to take into consideration all of these different factors and then use some kind of experimental apparatus, such as global climate modeling, to project into the future. So now that we know that we have global climate models and we know that we need them, how exactly do they work? Well, essentially what we do is we take Earth and we distribute it into a series of grid boxes because computers are very good at understanding what is happening in discrete locations. We can solve mathematics for one location on Earth. And so what we need to do is break Earth into a million, like hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of locations, at which point the computer can tell us what to expect at each one of those places. And so those are the grid boxes. We have the horizontal grid, so we break the Earth over latitude and longitude, and we also have the vertical grid. And the vertical grid is the height or the pressure 
Um, so when we're talking about the atmosphere, we're talking about just like looking at Earth and looking straight up towards space. We also have a vertical grid that stretches deep into the ocean because we also want to understand what's happening at the surface of the ocean and also deep down inside the ocean. And so we have all of these grid boxes and we have to represent really important components of the Earth on each one. And that's what's illustrated in this figure. So really at the at the top level, we're looking at things like how is the land behaving? How is the ocean behaving? We've already looked and seen from Mark's talk how important it is to understand the uh, how sea ice will change or how glaciers will change. And, you know, as we talked about clouds being really important and other things in the atmosphere, like greenhouse gases being important, the atmosphere also plays a tremendously important role in understanding how the Earth system will behave. So really, each process affecting the climate is distilled down into code. And that is how we build a global climate model. And so the next natural question is, once we have it, what exactly does it do? Well, in brief, global climate models compute the state of the world everywhere on the planet at each point in time. They're essentially like a synthetic Earth. They are our ability to take this giant experiment, which would be Earth, which is impossible to put into a laboratory setting where we can study it in lab coats. Instead, we have put it onto computers and we essentially have that laboratory setting. We have a synthetic Earth, at which point we can do things like increase the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere and see how the Earth will react, decrease it and see how the Earth will react. And this is how we get to the, uh, these um, future climate projections, which Mark talked about. So what does that look like? Well, this video here shows um, one such simulation from a global climate model. This is a global climate model that we work on here and develop at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And it's essentially indistinguishable from Earth. If I showed you this video without all of the things I just said, you might think we were looking at a satellite image, uh, satellite imagery of the whole planet. And so it allows us to uh, examine different aspects like cloud cover, which we're looking at now, or the ice coverage in the Antarctic or there in Greenland, for example. So, so far, it may seem like global climate models are pretty simple, but in fact, they're incredibly complex. And this can be illustrated just by looking at one of those components. In this case, we'll look at the atmosphere. So this diagram here shows many of the processes that we have to capture when we're trying to represent the atmosphere. So we have convection um, and microphysics, which has to do with clouds. How are clouds form, condensation of the clouds, evaporation or, or precipitation. We have things like fluid dynamics and turbulence, which is the movement of air or water or um, aerosols throughout the atmosphere. We have temperature fluxes, as Mark pointed out, you know, the sun emits radiation to the earth, which brings in heat, but the earth also emits heat back out into space. And how do we capture that physics? And then we have these aerosols, which are these very complex features of the atmosphere that, were, that are also very important in the formation of clouds or in the trapping of heat. And so we have to represent those as well. So in short, there's really just a lot of physics that we have to capture in each one of these components. And another really important takeaway is if you think about an aerosol, like the aerosols we saw in the cloud in a bottle, they're incredibly tiny. And I was saying that we have to break the earth down into all of these discrete points in order to solve mathematical expressions on them. And that is very difficult to do at the scales of something like aerosol. So we very quickly meet something called the resolution challenge in global climate modeling. And that is essentially just the fact that running all of this computational code for as many points as we can make is extremely computationally expensive. It requires a lot of work from the computers that we use. So we have to balance computer cost with solution accuracy. Now, just a little brief aside, I wanna go into some detail about what I mean by computer cost. So if we think of computer cost, it's the amount of work that a computer has to do. We can switch to the next slide. If you think about a simple task, like making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that's something that can be done relatively quickly and we can churn out a lot of those pretty quickly. So if I had to make a dinner party and all I was serving was PB and J, I could probably make five of those per minute. I could serve about 300 guests per hour. That's fantastic. That would be like a low computational cost because of course the computer is also doing either complex or simple tasks and it's churning out answers. Now, if I increase the complexity of the meal I wanna serve, say I wanted to be fancy and I wanted to serve sushi, well, that's going to change how effective I'm going to be, or at least how many people I can serve. I'm gonna maybe make three per hour. It's gonna be a very small dinner party. It's gonna be like at least a hundred times lower. So what happens is, is when we increase the resolution or we increase the level of physics that we're trying to represent in the model, well, then the complexity of the task makes it slower. So we have to balance this idea that we want to 
get about 100 years. We want to project like centuries into the future, but we also want really high accuracy. Or basically, we want a really quality dinner party that people want to come back to. So we have to balance the you know, meal prep versus just how many, how many people we can be essentially serve. And so that is what we call the resolution challenge. Now, the resolution challenge is made easier just by advancements in computational ability. So for the next four slides, we are going to go through uh, sort of the evolution of resolution. Uh, it's a pretty cool rhyme um, in computational modeling. And I'm going to have Mario on the side help me because it's essentially the same thing. You know, when we started off with the original Nintendo, this is the best we could hope for visualizing Mario. So on the left hand side, we're going to see how accuracy improves in the model, but also on the right hand side, that expense going up. And so we're going to see the expense increase as we go higher in resolution. So a long time ago, some of the early models use something like this a 500 kilometer model. So um, to put that in kind of perspective, we're looking at a, a chunk of Earth represented using 500 kilometer boxes. Now, we can see kind of like land and mountains and there's some ocean in there, but it's not incredibly rich in terms of detail, right? We don't really know if those little blue boxes in the middle of the land, if that's a lake or a river or an estuary. And we can't really tell how big that mountain range is on the upper left hand side. But as we march through better and better resolution, so going to 250 kilometers, so we're doubling the resolution, we can see some features emerge. Moving on to even finer resolution, 180 kilometers. Now that mountain range is really popping out. Matter of fact, it looks like there's a lake there in the bottom, and there might be an estuary up there in the right. And an island has emerged from that big blue section that was completely missing. And now if we jump to even higher, higher resolution, 100 kilometers, this is a very, this is a much more accurate representation of the planet in which we're trying to represent. So now we can see that all of those physics that are occurring, like the, the condensation of, of uh, condensate in the atmosphere or precipitation or what's happening over the ocean, or over the land, can be much better represented as we increase the resolution. And so we stop here at 110 kilometer resolution because this is essentially the conventional resolution that's currently used for a lot of those simulations well into the future that we saw in the previous section of the talk. Now, again, we're talking about 110 kilometers and what does that really mean? So I think it's important to put that into context. So here I'm going to talk about our conventional resolution, which we're currently using at 100 kilometers, and what we're doing at the cutting edge, which is three kilometer resolution. And this is something that's currently being work, uh, studied pretty heavily here at the lab and that we're working on developing a three kilometer model. So with a conventional model, we can expect to simulate centuries into the future because that computational cost is not as prohibitive. But as we push it to that incredibly high resolution of three kilometers, well, then we really bring back down how much, how much into the future we can simulate. We can really only expect about a year. So to put that in context and something we actually understand, let's look at what 100 kilometers actually looks like looking at the Bay Area. So most of us are from the Bay Area who are dialing in, so this should be, this should be hopefully uh, very um, understandable to us. But 100 kilometers pretty much encapsulates the whole Bay Area. Now, if we just think about one of the things we consider important, say like cloud cover or precipitation, as anybody who's lived in the Bay Area knows, What's happening in San Francisco is not the same as what's happening in Livermore. It can be really warm in Livermore and be super cold in San Francisco, right? So 100 kilometers gets us pretty good understanding of what's happening because the Bay Area, it's not snowing in San Francisco and not snowing in Livermore, for example. So it's not too extreme, but it doesn't give us really fine granular local information about what we could expect. Now, if we consider that white box, that's more on the three kilometer threshold. And if we zoom in on three kilometers, well, now we're looking at Livermore alone, right? And the lab is just there focused at the, um, in the upper right-hand corner. Now, three kilometers gives us incredibly good uh, information about what's happening at the local level. For example, if it's raining at the lab, we would expect it to also be raining in the neighborhood across the street. And the temperature is gradient is not going to change much over the course of that three kilometers. So going to three kilometers provides us with important local information, which is something that now we're really concerned about because we want to understand, you know, on a local level what to expect for the future and how we can plan for that. So just in kind of summary, the resolution challenge and the computational challenge. So as each new generation of computer chip comes out, we're able to push the threshold. Thinking about a three kilometer resolution model would have been a complete fantasy, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago even. And now it's something that seems like very much we can accomplish. So higher resolution gives us better representation of Earth's physics.
And this is just an illustration of what we're talking about when we're talking about new generations of computers, right? We have back in the 1960s, the old Cray, that's a huge machine and our phones are more powerful than that machine. And on the right hand side, we're looking at the cutting edge Sierra, which is a machine that we uh, have here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab is one of the fastest machines in the world. And it takes advantage of things like GPU technology. And for those of you who, um, you know, play video games are probably familiar with what GPUs are and the how um, how much hope they provide for being able to do fast computations um, on a massive scale. So, once you have a GCM, making predictions about the Earth is relatively easy. Here we are looking at that video again, and there's a dot. There's California. So, if I wanted to know in a couple of days if it's uh, you know how it's going to look in California, I can just you know ask the computer to tell me what's going on right there. But I just mentioned like what is going to happen in a couple of days, right? Or what's going to happen in a few hundred years? And many of you might be thinking, I'm pretty sure the long-term weather forecast can't be very reliable. So how can I trust that you know a lot about what's going on in the future a hundred years from now when I don't even trust you to tell me what's going to happen in two weeks? And that's a fair point. Uh, and a really important takeaway from this talk, I hope, is that there is a big difference between weather and climate. And that's what's going to be illustrated in the next few slides. So this diagram here shows us the predictive skill on the y-axis and the forecast lead time, or essentially how far into the future we're trying to make a prediction along the x-axis. And so we can see that we're pretty confident about predicting what's going to happen tomorrow, right? If we want to predict the weather tomorrow, we have weather balloons, we have a very good intuitive understanding of what is going to happen. And so we, we do actually kind of trust the weather forecast a few days into the future. But Weather is inherently chaotic. And the more that we push that lead time out, say next week, 10 days, two weeks, well, that chaos, that noise from the signal in the weather signal really degrades our ability to understand what's going to happen. And we really can't trust very well that we can predict, say, what's going to happen next month, for example. Now, the difference between weather, which is chaotic, and climate, which is not, is that climate is, is a signal which emerges from the chaos. It's really a statistical representation. We're not talking about predicting exactly what the temperature is going to be in Livermore in February of 2035. What we're really talking about is how is the, how is the temperature going to change? Is it going to be on average warmer, on average colder, et cetera? And that signal really emerges from the noise. And so actually it turns out that as we push that lead time out and we start looking at climate signal rather than just weather prediction, our predictive skill goes back up because that signal really emerges from the noise and we have more confidence, kind of the same as we had confidence about trying to figure out what's happening tomorrow. So main takeaway, climate and weather are not the same thing because weather is a prediction of a specific event, whereas climate is, is a prediction of trends or expectations. So. Once you have a JCM, making predictions is easy, provided you have a more power, a powerful enough computer. But even on the fastest computers, as I talked about um, previously, we really can't predict more than a few weeks into the future if we're really running at those cutting edge, um, that cutting edge resolution, the three kilometer resolution. So we still need those 100 kilometer resolutions. And so then the question naturally arises, if we're running with those 100 kilometer resolutions, how can we possibly start making predictions on a more local scale? And we do have a technique for that, um, that's downscaling. So conventional GCMs at coarse resolution really can't resolve coastlines, mountain ranges, cities, as shown in this figure. This is a, a figure showing the precipitation pattern over California, but at 160 kilometer resolution. And from this figure, we can see like, Look, I can't even see the Central Valley in there. I can't see the Sierra Nevadas. I guess this is pretty good, but this is not maybe as local as I would want. But by applying the technique of downscaling, which extracts relationships that we already understand from coarse and fine resolution data, we can also extract fine resolution um, results. And so this downscaling technique applied to this 160 kilometers gives us the six kilometer mesh on the right hand side. And here we really do see the Sierra Nevadas. We see the Central Valley and we get a much better understanding of what the precipitation patterns might be in California. This is something that local um, local leaders can use to make, uh, you know, uh, make analyses or to make um, decisions about, you know, a policy, for example. So downscaling is very important. And artificial intelligence, which is the next slide, is a uh, very powerful tool, which we'll go into more detail in Gemma's talk in a moment, that can be used to improve our statistical downscaling. But an important thing with artificial intelligence is whether or not you trust it. And that is another thing that we're looking heavily into uh, here at Lawrence Livermore. So with that, I will pass the ball to Gemma. Thank you.
Morning, everybody. OK, so um, I'm going to talk to you about how we're using AI in, in our climate work. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you what AI is. So it's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. That was um, the phrase coined by the father of AI, which was John McCarthy. Um, so by intelligent, what we mean is that the system has the ability to learn and reason in a way that a human can. Um, so how um, I'm going to now talk about machine learning, which is a subset of AI. And machine learning is when computers can learn from data, but without being explicitly programmed. And what I'm going to be focusing on this talk is deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. And that is a, t a type of AI where neural networks are trained on vast amounts of data. So, um, the, and, the, and the algorithms that are used in deep learning are artificial neural networks and their algorithms are modeled to work like the human brain. Um, so that, and yeah, the, we need uh, a large amount of data for this, um, otherwise um, it's not possible. Um, so some examples of AI in everyday life, you may have um, be familiar with um, smart assistants such as Siri. There's also self-driving cars. Uh, and there's also uh, spam filters in your email. Um, really, the the list is is getting is getting to be endless these days. Um, so why would we want to use deep learning in climate? Well, climate data is an example of big data. We have the data from climate models, from satellites, and and many more. Um, and there's also many aspects of the climate that we don't understand. So deep learning has the potential to be extremely useful for climate because there are um, because um, you can um, capture a lot of complex patterns and connections that you can't easily identify um, that can't easily be identified by humans. Okay, so here at Livermore, we've been applying deep learning to a bunch of different um, important issues in climate, and I'm going to talk about three ways that I've been using it in my work. Um, so the first is deep learning super resolution. Um, so this is when you take a, a low resolution uh, image and you train a neural network to predict a high resolution image. Um, so you basically learn the relationship between the low and the high. Um, and so um, we can apply this technique um, to downscale our climate model data. Um, so um, as, as Aaron had mentioned, um, the outputs from a typical GCM, they're coarse and they're not able to capture this information on a fine scale that you sometimes require in order to determine climate impacts on a local scale. So what we did was we trained a neural network on observations to learn this relationship between low and high resolution. And then we can apply that to coarse resolution climate model outputs to obtain higher resolution predictions. And the benefit of this is that it allows us to make these predictions very quickly and cheaply. Um, so I, I think that maybe there's a bit of a lag in the slide. So next slide. If so here, what I'm showing is the daily temperature over the Western US over a five year period where this model didn't actually see. So we, what we did was we trained it on, on some, some previous years and in the, it, to learn this relationship um, between the low and the high resolution. And so as you go to the right, it's increasing in resolution and it's going all the way down to four kilometers, which is very fine scale resolution. Um, and so the top row was our, is our observation. So that's our ground truth. And then the bottom row is our prediction using our, our neural network. So as you can see, um, they, they look pretty similar. And so the, it's doing a, a really good job at capturing these relationships as you, as you go through um, to higher resolution. Um, OK, so next slide. Um, so before I talk about in more detail about um, what the, the next application, I want to just introduce um, the idea of generative adversarial networks and they're really, really cool. Um, so the goal with them is like in this setup is that you want to generate an image of a cat that looks so realistic that you can't tell the difference between real and fake. So you start with a bunch of cats and you take out a sample from that. Um, next slide. And then you have um, a pseudo random number generator. And so the generator here the, in the little um, the little sort of rectangular box is um, not rectangular, but um, that um, that weird, weird shaped box is um, you're going to generate an image of a cat. And then you bring in a discriminator network. So this is another neural network. And its job is to determine was that a real 
image or was that a fake image? And so basically by, by training these together, the discriminator gets better and better at distinguishing between a real and fake. And the generator has to work harder to generate more realistic images of a cat. And eventually, after you've trained this for long enough, the, the generator will be then generating images that look so realistic that you cannot actually tell the difference between the two. So um, how is this related to climate? Well, so if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, so there, so there, there are certain things that um, that that are not captured very well in the climate models because um, you have to estimate anything that's happening on a subgrid scale. So any any sort of processes that happen um, that um, on a subgrid scale, they cannot be resolved, and so you end up getting there. There's like a bias there. Um, so we've been using these generative adversarial networks to bias correct our climate models. So it's and it's going to be a very similar setup. So we have our observations and. Um, so this is over the continental US, this is precipitation that I'm showing. So you take a sample um, out of observations and then you have your climate model simulation. So you base, you pull out a sample out of your climate model simulation. And we know that those two uh, are not identical because uh, there are these biases. So now you have this bias correct, which is kind of like the generator Example, and it tries to, to apply a correction to this climate simulation that makes that then produces a map that is that is trying to match observations. And so again, in the same way as, as before, you have now a discriminator that has to decide is this observation or is this simulation? And by training this for, for long enough, what you end up getting is a bias corrector that corrects the simulations and it um, in such a way that that the corrected, the corrected map looks indistinguishable from observation. So by doing this, you're you're learning how to correct your climate models, which is very very important when you when you want to then make make decisions and and you want to make predictions, uh, um, on on like on yeah for the future. Uh, so next slide. So then the final thing I want to talk about. So you. Remember that graph that Aaron showed where it said weather scale was you were you had some pred predictive capability and then when you go out to climate and there was this sort of like um this slump in the middle where um the predictive capability really goes down and seasonal forecasts are an example um of of that. Um so they but they are critical for adapting to climate change. But um so the way that you want to um capture uh, this sort of an initial condition uncertainty and all of the other uncertainties is you basically want to run it many, many times to capture the uncertainties because you won't know exactly which, which, uh, where you end up. So you, you're this red line, but you don't know um, accurately enough on these timescales. So what you do is you just run a climate model many, many times. So as you can imagine, this is going to be very computationally expensive. And so what we did, um, going on to the next slide, is that we used probabilistic deep learning in 50,000 years of climate simulations. So this is our, our, our problem setup. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but um, we, we start with our July ocean temperature. And then we have a probabilistic deep neural network that is a, we're able to capture those uncertainties uh, to make a prediction for the season ahead for winter precipitation and temperature global globally. And so instead of just getting one one answer for prediction and temperature, you now get a you now get a spread. You now get a, a distribution of, of possible answers, and this was made possible with our our probabilistic deep neural network framework. Um, and in, in the next slide, I will show you that it, it, it that it works. So this on the left is our model. This is our deep our deep learning model, and then on the right is our st is the state of the art forecast ensemble. So for them, they actually did run. The model many, many times to build on um, And this is showing that I'm showing the results here for temperature and, and it's the anomaly um, correlation coefficient. So it's just basically the higher the higher the number, the better you're doing because you're, you're now validating it with real observations. 
excuse me, real observations. Um, so where it's red, that means it's doing really well. Um, so you can see that that we're, you know, achieving very competitive performance for um, for temperature compared to these very costly dynamical forecasts. And one other benefit of, of this is it really allows us to help um, diagnose and then subsequently improve the actual climate models, which um, is always, you know, it's, it's one of our, our goals. So, yeah, so I introduced the three ways that we're using uh, deep learning in our work um, and now to summarize. Um, so what Mark had said was that, you know, the earth is, is climate is undergoing to changes caused by that and it's going to be mostly bad for us. And then, um, and also uh, that future warming depends uh, on us, how much CO2 we're going to emit, and also mostly clouds, so how sensitive the climate um, is. And um, as Aaron had mentioned, we're getting better at modeling the climate, including those pesky clouds. And I hope I convinced you that cutting edge artificial intelligence will be, will allow us for even better forecasts. And now we're 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 welcome. Um, if you'd like to have any questions, all right. Thank you, everyone. And we do have some questions that were put into the chat. And uh, the first one I have is from Maddie, who wants to know what would happen to the world if everyone stopped using greenhouse gases uh, altogether. Who would like to feel that one? I, th I think I'm unmuted, right? Yep. We can yeah, hear you. that's a that's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, I'll I'll take a stab at that. Um, it turns out that if you if you make rapid, dramatic cuts in emissions, so you actually get to zero or net zero emissions, um, warming largely ceases. Um, so none of so in those scenarios that I showed, the um, kind of the blue the green scenario where warming kind of flatlines into the future, that would be a scenario where you have very dramatic cuts in emissions, so going to zero. Um, as long as there's some amount of emissions into, into the atmosphere, the warming will continue. But as soon as the emissions uh, get to zero, and that could mean net emissions, that means you might still be able to emit a little bit, but if you're also at the same time drawing out CO2 from the atmosphere, um, that which is known as net zero, um, warming essentially ceases, it flatlines at that point. But um, it takes a very, very, very long time for the warming to, for the, war the warming that we've already achieved to go back down to say pre-industrial levels. So, um, you know, the warming level that we're at right now, we are, that is pretty much for, the, for um, centuries into the future, we're at least going to have that much of a global temperature rise relative to pre-industrial. It takes a very, very long time to reverse the warming, but you can at least stop the warming um, if the emissions go to net zero. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, we have another one from Varun. Uh, what is the carbon footprint for the supercomputer uh, supercomputer being used at LNML? Does anyone feel like? I, I'll, I'll attempt to answer. We don't. I don't have the raw numbers for you, and I'll, I'll point out that the supercomputer used at LNNL is used for uh, more studies than just climate. It's, um, you know, there are super the supercomputers are created to do, um, you know, amazing studies in lots of different fields of physics. But it's a fair question. The carbon footprint. There is a carbon footprint because it takes a lot of um, electricity to power the computers, and mostly actually to keep the computers cold so they don't overheat. Um, you know, so we have to, you know, uh, power some pretty heavy air conditioning. So, yeah, it's a fair question. I don't have raw numbers for you, but there is there is a carbon footprint associated with, of course, running um, heavy computations. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question here from Aksha. Aksha, uh, what are some problems that climate changes climate change causes? I could take the first shot at this. Um, I pointed out one of them locally here being wildfires. Um, uh, one of the major issues with climate change isn't so much the fact that the planet warms or that you have you know a couple degrees of warming over centuries. It's 
how that affects things like precipitation, um, rainfall. Um, there's certain areas where you very much rely on having rainfall at certain times of the year and climate change can disrupt that. Um, there's certain places like here where, you know, you'd like to get, um, you, you don't want to have an extremely long, prolonged dry season um, as we've been having the last few winters actually, um, because it just, at, it just creates a lot of uh, fuel. It dries out the fuel um, for allowing for these mega fires that we've been experiencing. Um, and of course, drought and aridity is very bad for agriculture as well. So, um, you know, it, there's a lot of different things. And I think the biggest one um, is things that relate to precipitation. And especially if you're in a country that's not particularly rich and have a great infrastructure for dealing with that, if you're in a country that doesn't have, um, you know, doesn't maybe doesn't have a lot of money, um, it's a lot harder to to navigate a world with with you know agriculture failing and uh, crop failures. So um, there's a wide variety of negative impacts from climate change that you know pretty objectively far outweigh the any sort of benefit you might gain from. Uh, a warmer planet. Uh, Stanley, can I just jump in really quick to, sure. to add an addendum Absolutely. to my answer about the carbon footprint? Um, someone mentioned to me kind of offline that it's important to note that Lawrence Livermore Lab has a solar farm which we use to power the computers. And so that offsets the local carbon footprint for us running our uh, high performance computing center. Great. Uh, let's see, I had a question. Uh, from Jack, what programming languages are used for the machine learning and data models? So we use uh, Python as the programming language, and then within Python, you can there's there are uh, deep learning packages, so AI packages, so you can use. So what we specifically use PyTorch for that, but there's also TensorFlow that you may have heard of. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I got one from, I think it's Cabra, uh, do little things help or does there need to be a major drastic changes of, uh, shifted. Both. Uh, yeah, Both prevent help. climate change. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely, definitely the little things help because if you imagine if everybody does the little things, then that could have uh, a huge itself, but also there, there does need to be some drastic changes. Okay. Uh, here's a question. Uh, I think it's, it's from Maxim. The response of plants, microbes, insects, and other living creatures to the change of climate is probably too complex to predict and model quantitative, quantitatively. Does that add a large uncertainty for the climate prediction? I'll take a stab at that one. So, yes, I mean, that actually, I think broadly speaking, like it's a point I was trying to make with the, you know, change in re like the resolution challenge, right? Is that at 100 kilometers, we're also talking about a lot of different land cover features, um, especially if you think about like the San Francisco Bay Area. So, you're talking about scales that are incredibly fine. So, it does add to the uncertainty, and there, there, you know, that's one of the other aspects that we are looking at in terms of just the global climate modeling community. Um, again, I would say that the models are getting better. The science is getting much stronger. And so our land models are also improving and their ability to quantify, maybe not on the granular level of like this particular plant, how well does it do at, at capturing carbon, but um, in terms of just changes in land cover and, and you know, forestation, for example, and how what impact that would have, that's actually getting captured much better. And then again, as we go to these cutting edge models and running at really high resolution, um, we're able to then, you know, zone in on a particular land cover. It's, it's reasonable to expect that over the course of three kilometers, there's not going to be dramatic changes in the land cover. And so we can really capture uh, a better patchwork. So, yeah, I mean, um, it's a difficult problem. I think that's one of the, another important takeaway. Uh, but when we're looking at things in terms of trends, instead of just trying to focus on one specific point, um, you know, that signal does emerge. And so we can still get a lot of important information, even at the course of resolutions. Great. We've got so many great questions, but we, we're just going to take time for one last question. And this comes from uh, Manjit. Uh, what GPU does the supercomputer use? So it changes. Um, 
So then uh, they basically we we get contracts with Nvidia and AMD. So um, it really depends on who the contracts with and how recent the contract is, right? So we buy the we purchase the most cutting edge computational technology we can at the time that the machine was commissioned. And um, you know the the machine creators like Nvidia, for example, they're clamoring to be part of that contract because it gives them also the ability to talk about how powerful their GPUs are and the kind of great science that's being used with them. So it's really good for them as well. So um, I can't really say exactly, I don't know off the top of my head what Sierra uses, but I know that we we do go back and forth between um, you know the different chip makers. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for a great presentation and for joining us today. And thank you for those who participated throughout our Science on Saturday series. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everybody.